what you do today, Miss Nani? You want to shoot rock? No? Not today, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Well, let's pray. Yeah. Father, we give you glory and honor, thank Lord. We thank you for your protection, Lord, your divine protection. We, we plead the blood of Jesus, Lord. We thank you that they're safe and that, Lord, they're here with Jen and, and Rich, Lord God. But we pray for their property and pray, Lord God, your divine protection, that you would touch them and that you build a hedge around them, Lord God. And, Lord, as I prayed earlier today, I pray for every house of God, every child of God. I pray, Lord God, that you would that you would just cover them in your precious blood. I pray for that church, uh, Jesus image, Lord. I pray that you would protect them, Lord God, and their people, Lord. But I pray for all of your people, Lord. I pray, Lord God, that you would spare life. I pray that you would be merciful, Lord. After what we've seen in North Carolina, Lord, we, we, we cry out to you and pray that you would have mercy, Lord. I pray that you'd have mercy on our nation, Lord God. I pray that you'd have mercy upon the hearts of your people, Lord, your, your people that are called by your name. Lord, I pray that you would begin to move, Lord, on us, Lord, and in our hearts. Lord God, I pray that we would begin to cry out to you, Lord. And Lord God, we see the signs of the times, Lord, the things that are happening. We're not just talking about storms, Lord, but all the other things that are raging in the world. And we pray, Lord God, that you grab a hold of us, Lord God, that we give you glory and honor for your protection, Lord, over this family. And I pray that while they're here, Lord, you would minister to them. And we just give you glory and honor in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord God, for ministering to that baby also, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Well, last week we, uh, we talked about Romans chapter 2. Amen. And, one, and some of the uh, bigger thoughts in Romans chapter 2 had to do with uh, conscience and law. And we talked about the fact that, um, that the law, that the law is, the purpose was to reveal to man what God's character and also to reveal to man how badly he needed God's help and assistance. Amen. And that the law of God shows man what God's holiness is. And that for the Jew that had the law in their life, the truth is, is that they should have been able to see where they were not lining up with God's will and God's word. Amen. Then it talked about the conscience because, you know, there's a whole world out there that doesn't have the law, if you will, or, or weren't living under the law. Because especially at that time, not everyone really even understood what the law of God was. Really, only the Jewish people did. But the scripture teaches us that God put his conscience, put a conscience in man. Uh, I've heard preachers say before where it's like God's copyright on the human soul. And so God has placed a conscience on the inside of man. And what it said in Romans chapter 2 is this, is that just as the law is for the Jews, so the conscience is for the Gentile. And that, that the conscience of man will either accuse him or excuse him. Uh, right. And what we're going to see tonight, though, is, is that the scripture teaches us that all men have gone astray from the Lord. Amen. And uh, as a matter of fact, if we get to Romans chapter three, I'm going to be in the ESV version of the Bible tonight. And we'll see that that it's I believe it's important that we understand who we are in Adam so that we can really understand who we are in Christ. Amen. Because if we don't really understand who we are without the Lord. It's, it's hard for us to get a revelation of his goodness and his love and his long suffering and his patience and his kindness with us. Amen. And so here we start in verse one of Romans chapter three and the ESV is what I'm reading out of. I then I, I'm sorry. Then what advantage has the Jew or what is the value of circumcision much in every way to begin with? The Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. What if some were unfaithful? 
Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means let God be true, though everyone were a liar as it is written. Now this is quoted out of Psalm 51 and we'll come back to it in a moment, but I just wanted to bring it to your attention that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. So the scripture saying that God undergoes judgment. We'll talk about that in a moment. But if our, uh, if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? I speak in a human way. By no means. For then how could God judge the world? But if through my lie, God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? And why not do evil that good may come? As some people slanderously charge us with saying, their condemnation is just. That the Apostle Paul says about these statements that these people were making against his, his ministry. I, I just want to go back up to verse verse 2 where, where, where it's... It, it prefaces with verse one. It says, what advantage then is there of being a Jew? What is the value of circumcision? We mentioned circumcision maybe a little too much last week, but we mentioned circumcision in that it's a co the covenant that God had. It's the sign of the covenant that God had with the Old Testament Israelites, right? And that it was an external sign that showed that they were in proper that they were in covenant relationship with God and at the end of chapter 2 it talked about the fact that a true Jew is not one that's external and that circumcision is not external but a true Jew is one that's inwardly and that circumcision is actually of the heart amen and so what he was talking about he hasn't gotten us there yet he's going to introduce us to it tonight but what he's talking about is that in the gospel of grace in the gospel of the new testament which is really Jesus we need to understand that Jesus is the new covenant that in the new covenant something transforms something miraculous happens on the inside of us amen when we when we give our heart to the lord when our faith meets God's plan, then a miracle happens on the inside of our heart. And that miracle that takes place is that is that there's a, a the Holy Spirit comes to live in us and, and we're transformed. The, the old man that we were born of Adam and all of the sin that we were born into, amen, and the Lord washes it away. He said it in Isaiah chapter 1, though your sins be like scarlet, they will be made white like snow. Though they be crimson, they will be made white like wool. You can be rest assured tonight that if you have given your heart to the Lord, amen, that your sins have been washed away, amen, and the Lord has removed them as far as the east is from the west. Praise God. He's a good God, and, and I, want you to, I want you to know that tonight. And so, but, but for the, for the Jewish man, he had a hard time letting go of that. That's why Jesus underwent such persecution by the Pharisees. That's why, um, Christians went under, were under such persecution, even by Saul of Tarsus before he was converted on the road to Damascus, he was persecuting, right? He was going to get letters from the, from the leaders in Damascus in order to throw the people that were of the way, the Christians to throw them into prison and to kill them, but the Lord, praise God, miraculously changed his heart, changed his life, just like he's changed many of you in here yeah. tonight. Amen. Can I get an amen? amen? Praise God. Thank you for changing us, Lord. Yes. Amen. amen. And so he's saying, well, so then what is the value of circumcision and what is the value even of being a Jew? And this is what he says. He says, much in every way. And then he says this, to begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. <laughs> That, that word oracles, man, I love that word. An oracle is a mouthpiece that speaks the things of God. It's a messenger that speaks the things of God. And, and what God is saying is this, is that the Jewish people, right? The Jewish people as a nation, you know, listen, we, we've talked about these kinds of things a lot. And I don't mean to make it too Sunday school-like, but there was no nation called Israel, right? 
And y'all know, y'all, most of y'all know the story that God called a man named Abraham out of Iraq. And through this man, he made a nation called Israel. I mean, Israel was actually his grandson, Jacob. His name was changed to Israel. Correct. And then, and then through, through that, he gave, he gave the world Jesus. But like we were saying along the way right here, and you can read this in Deuteronomy 4, Deuteronomy 6, Deuteronomy 8. When God's promising to bring the children of Israel into the promised land, he talks about the fact that you're going to bring the law of God with you where you're going. And you're going into a land where the people don't know. They don't know their gods like you know your God. Okay, I mean, I'm paraphrasing. And he says, when you get there, what's going to happen is they're going to see your, the word of God that you have. And he said, listen, this is what I want you to do. I want you to tie the word of God around the post of your house. I want you to wear it like a frontlet on your head. And I want you to put it like a wristlet on your arm. I want the word of God to be part of your everyday life. I want it in the morning when you wake up. I want it. I want you to talk about it around, around the table whenever you eat. I want your children to be inquisitive because you talk so much about the word. And what's going to happen is, is that when you get to this land, these people, they're going to see something and they're going to say what other people is there that have their God so close to them and he said it's because of the word and so Israel as a nation were the oracles of God and God's plan for them was that they would that they would disseminate or that they would be messengers of God's word of God's plan amen and so much in every way for Christian much in every way for you that you would have the oracles of God that the, oracles of God, that the oracles of God, which is the living word, the living word became the, the, the word that spoke the world into existence. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Amen. And nothing was made that wasn't made through the word for the word spoke all things into existence. And then the word became flesh and he dwelt amongst us. Amen. And, 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 and then he died for us. Amen. And whenever that gospel message, whenever that was, wherever that was, when that gospel message hit your heart, amen, for real, you know what I'm talking about? And, and, and your heart got circumcised, whatever that looks like. We're not, we're not, we don't have to get into deep doctrinal theology tonight. Let us just know that at some point in time, the Holy Ghost moved in. And when he moved in, he started changing things. Amen. And, and, and whenever that happened, the living word came alive on the inside of you. And I need you to understand something that the presence of God is on the inside of you and that you have become an oracle. You are supposed to be an oracle of the living God. Your life is supposed to be a, an epistle, which is a letter, right? Th that shows forth the goodness of God. And, and the good news is this, is that you don't have to do it in your own strength. You can't do it in your own strength. Amen. You've been in this walk any length of time, you're going to realize that all you're trying and all you're endeavoring is going to leave you dry. It's going to leave you falling flat on your face. But if we would learn to trust in him, Amen. if we would learn to, to really grab a hold of the son and allow him to have his way in us, I'm telling you right now, he'll transform our heart. He'll transform our life. And it'll never be the same. Amen. And so I just wanted you to see. And then he goes on to say this. He said, but what if the, if, if our faithlessness shows the faithfulness of God, or if our unrighteousness <laughs> shows the righteousness of God, well, then how can God be righteous in, in pouring wrath upon us? And then, and then later on, he'll say that in that he'll say something similar to that in, at the end of Romans five, before he transitions into six and he's going to say, you know, well, so what shall we say? If sin did about, if sin, the, if where sin did about, grace did much more abound, then maybe we should just sin. Because if we sin, then, then there's going to be more grace. And so that's what they were saying back then is what I, is that I don't want to get too deep into this part here, but I just want you to know that's what they were saying back then. What are they saying today? What are they saying about God today? I mean, yeah, you know, Lord knows what they're saying, right? Some of y'all are on social media more than others. I, I had to get off of that. <laughs> but, but you see that they're saying a lot of things. And they're calling God into question. They're constantly calling God into question. And that's where I brought you a second ago but to that psalm where it says that you may be justified in your words and that you will prevail when you are judged. 
See, man is trying to call God to the judgment seat. And no, God's the judge. But at the same time, God is a just judge. And he's going, he made himself just. And we're going to learn in this chapter how he did that because God must deal with sin because God is holy. Amen. And so that's what was being said then. And that's why they said it then. And humanity will always say things against God and his word because, because of the human heart. The human heart wants what it wants. Y'all need to help me out here a little bit. Make sure I'm not, make sure I'm in the right church. The, the human heart wants what it wants. Amen. Amen. Come on, somebody Amen. help me out. Y'all know y'all, y'all know how long y'all been serving the Lord. I mean, I'm not going to make you raise your hand. You've been serving the Lord five years. Okay, you've been saved five years. Okay, if that would have been you, act like you raised your hand. You don't have to. You've been saved 10 years, 15 years. But yet at the same time, Lord, we need you to do a work in our heart because we so oftentimes find ourselves wanting what we want, change our the desires of our heart that we would want what you want, right? And so that's the human heart. Now, if you could go to Psalm 51 verse 4, because see, this is David. This is the psalmist David. And listen, he wrote this psalm. He wrote Psalm 32 and Psalm 51 after he had sinned with Bathsheba. Whatever the reason, David didn't want to go to war. It wasn't because he was scared. I can promise you that. David was not a scared. I don't believe he was scared. He was a warrior. But he, he wanted to stay at home. And then he saw Bathsheba and he wanted her. And then he wanted to make it all go away. And so he killed her husband. And, and that's what he wanted. But look, when, when he comes to the end of himself. Y'all remember the story, Nathan the prophet? Boy, that was so powerful. It's, none of this is in my notes, but let's just go ahead and talk about it. Nathan the prophet comes to him, and you remember that? He said there was a rich man. He had a bunch of flocks, and there was a, and there was a poor man. And he just had one little precious ewe lamb. And there was a traveler coming through. And the rich man, who obviously had power, said, We need to, we need to go ahead and dress a, a lamb for this traveler. And why, why don't we just go ahead and take your one little precious ewe lamb, yeah. and why don't we offer that up to the stranger? And David, in anger, probably clenching his fist and gritting his teeth, said, Hugh, you just tell me who he is, and I'll take care of him. And Nathan the prophet said, you're the man. You're the man. You're the guilty one because you took Uriah the Hittite's wife, you took her for yourself, and then you had him killed. And I mean, you know what's amazing is to understand the reality of what the Word of God says about David. That might be hard for you to grasp that, that a man that had done such things. And listen to me, none of this is in the notes, but look, there was no sacrifice in the law. The Levitical law did not offer a sacrifice for adultery or premeditated murder. It wasn't there. They both required stoning to death. But yet in this psalm, I'm not going to get into the whole psalm, but listen, in this psalm, he says, purge me with hyssop and I will be clean. Right. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. And then when he says that, purge me with hyssop. Listen, I did a study on this and I'm here to tell you, hyssop was, and David would have known this because it's in the book of Exodus. And hyssop was what they used to dip in the, in the blood on the Passover night when they painted it on the doorpost and on the side post. Because God said that you're going to take an innocent lamb and you're going you're gonna to sacrifice it. And when you put, your, put the blood on your, on your door, I'm going to pass over judgment. And I believe with all of my heart that David's crying out for new covenant grace. He doesn't even understand it completely. Completely, but he knows according to the law, he has no hope. He has no help. And he cries out, purge me with his son. But this is what he says right here. He says, against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. David understands that you're blameless when you judge me, Lord. And you know, the baby died. He, David knew. He, he said, I got to get my heart right. I got to get my heart right with the, with the Lord. Amen. I, I got to make sure that, yes. that things are right between us. And I got to repent because you're the right judge. You're the righteous one. I'm not the righteous one in this situation. And I think it's so important that we understand that. 
about ourselves. Amen. As a matter of fact, the Bible is going to let, not going to let us off the hook. We're about to see it. Okay, y'all ready? Here we go. Romans uh, chapter 9, the caption. We're going to read verses 9 through 20. We'll just go ahead and read 9 through 20. The caption says, no one is righteous. He says, what then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin as it is written. So in chapter 1, he made it clear that all the Gentiles are guilty. Then in chapter 2, he said, no, you Jews, you're, you're inexcusable, oh man, you who judge, and yet you do the same thing. And, and, we, and we know that, that there's been times in our own lives that we've cast judgment on people. Listen, the scripture's clear, and I mean, I wasn't going to go there tonight, but there's there's things that are stated in the letter to the Corinthian church that we are to judge. We're to judge the body of Christ. We're not supposed to really judge the world. I'm just going to be real with you because what do we expect the world to do? <laughs> the world's going to do worldly things. Yeah. Jesus ate and meat with sinners. We, we, you know, we got to we got to grab a hold of this. But at the same time, we're supposed to we're supposed to judge the things that the people that call themselves Christian and brothers. The scripture says that people are living out loud a certain way in their life. Now, now, listen, we maybe we need to get a better definition. And when I say we, I'm including myself of what it means to truly be born again. Maybe there's times that we think that people, but, but, but look, just because somebody's sitting in the church doesn't mean that they're born again. And let me say this, people from the world are welcome in the church. I want to make that clear. People from the world are welcome in the church. But until a person is truly converted, we cannot expect them to live like a Christ-like life. You can't live for Christ until the Holy Spirit lives in you and he's empowering you. Amen. But if a but if a person's calling themselves a brother, then they need to be held accountable. If a person's calling themselves a sister, they need to be held accountable. That's the apostle Paul said that. He re, he rebuked Corinth and he yes. told him that. And so so it's important for us to understand that. All right. He says, Are we as Jews any better off? Not at all. We've charged both Jews and Greeks are under sin as it is written. None is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good. Not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law. So that every mouth may be stopped. And the whole world may be held accountable to God. In the King James it says guilty. But in the Greek it says under sentence. That the whole world may be under sentence to God. For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight since through the law comes knowledge of sin. So I just want you to know that that the, the, you, we can't keep the law. We know that. And, and the scripture is real clear. It's not just a hearer of the law, but it's the doer of the law. And if you can't do the law, then you can't li try to live under the law because it's going to pronounce you guilty. And really a main part of what the law does is that the law actually reveals what sin is. The law reveals to the heart of man what sin is. We're not even close to there, but in Romans chapter 7, he said, is, the, is, is there something, I'm paraphrasing, but is there something wrong with the law? No, God forbid. He said, the law is holy. He said, I'm the one that's carnal, sold under sin. He says, as a matter of fact, I wouldn't have known that what that thou shalt not covet had the law not told me thou shalt not covet. He, went, he said, I wouldn't have even known what that meant if the law wouldn't have told me that. And so the law has its purpose, but the law in the new covenant, and now that Christ has come, it's, it's, it's not how we live for righteousness. Does that make sense? And I think it's important. Like, in other words, we can't earn righteousness with God. And it's important that we understand that. And look, the whole book of Romans is really about the righteousness of God and what it means to live a righteous life or, and how to live a righteous life. So I want to encourage you tonight because in the book of Romans, it, it teaches us how uh, to, to live for the Lord. And so 
I just wanted to say, it says, uh, you know, when it, when it talked about, are the Jews any better off? No, not at all. But, but not only that, not, not just Jews, but what about Christians? What about the religious heart, right? That's what I really wanted to get to because, see, when he was talking about the Jews, he's talking about religion. Yeah. He's talking about, and listen, we got we to gotta understand this, that, that we have a tendency in our flesh to get puffed up. And that's our flesh because you can see that in Galatians chapter, chapter 5. It, it talks about envy, jealousy. Listen, sometimes when we don't get our way, we'll try to cause division in the house of God. We'll try to get, as a matter of fact, when it talks about sex, like uh, S-E-C-T-S, I have a hard time saying that word. S-E-C-T-S, which is a, kind of a division. Okay, a lot of those words about emulation and wrath, a heresy, even the word heresy is not just false doctrine, but it's connected to false doctrine, but it's dividing people. It's making a division and trying to come in and to divide God's people, right? That's a lust of the flesh. That's in you. But can I tell you, newsflash, there are spirits of religion. Yes. Like we, the Apostle Paul is very clear. You are not in a war against flesh and blood. But against principalities and powers, against spiritual wickedness and world rulers and spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. And listen to me. Sometimes whenever we operate in that religious mindset, that puffed up prideful mindset, we give we give permission to become blinded to that. And I, don't, I know that you, you people in here, you don't want to be blinded to that. I don't, I don't want to be blinded to that. And I don't want to, I'm not looking to be bound by no, no, no religious spirit. There's only one spirit that I want moving and operating in my life, and it's the Holy Spirit. There's only one spirit we want moving and operating in this house, amen, and it's the Holy Spirit. And, and so, so the Jews, are they any better off? Not at all. He said we've already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, and there's none righteous, right? So good news is, is that he says none are righteous. No, not one. I want you to know this. If you're saved tonight, that's, this isn't talking about you. And it's important that we understand that. If you are saved tonight, this is not talking about you. Now, you step outside the grace of the Lord, you find out how quick you start looking like that again. Right? And, and we still have this Adamic nature in us. We're, we're going to really break that down when we get to Romans 6. But I want you to know that that sinful nature, it's it's in us, but it's not supposed to be alive and it's not supposed to be it's not supposed to be uh, it's not supposed to be uh, alive. It's not supposed to be shifted into gear. It's not supposed to be in control. Amen. It's supposed to be dormant. The, the, the sense, the power of the sinful nature really right now is supposed to be in neutral. It's not supposed to be leading and guiding the life of the believer, right? No, because now you become a partaker of the divine nature. That's what Peter wrote. Peter said that in Christ, you've become a partaker of the divine nature. That means that the Holy Spirit, when we yield to him, we're giving him permission to have his way in our hearts and in our lives. So I want you to know there's a potential Right, but I need, but I need you. To, and, and listen, separate from Christ, this is who we are. Thank you, Jesus. It doesn't sound good. It doesn't feel good. Mm -hmm. But separate from God intervening in our lives, this is who we are. Now, one of the things that I've learned about the goodness of God is this: is that despite Matt, God loves me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And despite of what I've, how I've done, and the decisions that I've made, thank you, Jesus. For your long suffering and your mercy and your kindness. Amen. Yes. And, and so I want you to know that this isn't you tonight. But look at some of the words that he says in verse 13. He says, he says, their throat is an open grave. And really, if you read it, if you read some scholars, they're like, it's like a it's like a the belching of a tomb. It's like if you roll the stone away and it's like the stench belched out. I'm not going to try to belch, but you get the point. The sound of a belch and the smell and the stench of death. He's saying that, that this is what people's throats are like a, a tomb full of death. And, and listen, I don't know if you were anything like me when you were in the world, but I was a mess sometimes, y'all. And listen, even after being a Christian, I used to be bound by a gossip spirit. I'm just going to be real with you. I want to be transparent tonight. Because, because I got to tell you that being having a gossip spirit is not a good thing. 
when we when we slander and we and we have malice listen malice is ugly malice is not of the holy spirit when we have when we have envy jealousy in our hearts and we and we use our tongue to talk about brothers and sisters in the lord L listen god's a faithful god he loves you he loves me but we but we we got to recognize if these things are still in our lives amen and we need to bring it to the lord we need to let him have his way in our life. So he says there, and they use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Well, that's some strong words, huh? Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's, it doesn't seem like Paul was, I don't know. Wasn't very seeker sensitive right there. I don't, I don't reckon he was, I don't know. I'm not trying to, I mean, I guess I was trying to be funny a little bit, but it's real. I mean, it's like, you get, you don't even have to try to interpret that, dude. You just read that and it's like, wow, Paul, you were a, uh, you were really on there, huh? So, but what I wanted to read to you was James, because see, it's not supposed to be that way for believers, Amen. right? And so in James chapter three, verses eight through 16, this is in the NASB. I'm sorry, this is the Bible I grabbed. But no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and Father. With it, we curse men. Who have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come both blessing and cursing. Look at this. I want you to see this part. My brethren. Amen. He's talking to the brothers. He says. He says. My brethren. These things ought not to be this way. It ought to not be this way church. Where, where out of our mouth we bless our Lord. And then out of our mouth we curse our brother. It just ought to not be that way. Amen. He says, does a fountain send out from the same opening both fresh and bitter water? Can a fig tree, my brethren, produce olives or a vine produce figs, nor can salt water produce fresh? Now, I wanted you to see this part here because it talks about wisdom. He says, who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior, his deeds and the gentleness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, it was just too good not to read it. <laughs> it's not still talking about the tongue, but it's still just too good not to read it. Amen. Selfish ambition in your heart. Listen, boy, I tell you, Lord, show us. Y'all know what I'm talking about? There's been time. Listen, sometimes I still see that stuff trying to creep up in me. Yes. I just want to be real. I don't want that in my heart. You let that stuff run rampant in your heart, man. I'm telling you. He said selfish ambition in your heart. Do not be arrogant and lie against the truth. He says this wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly. Look at this. Earthly, natural, demonic. Look at this. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. But the wisdom from above is first pure, peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering without hypocrisy. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. That sounds like Jesus right there. Amen. Amen. Meek and mild spirit. That's what I want. I'm telling you right now, last week, the Lord's doing something in me. I'm just like, Lord, I just want you, man. I, I didn't say man to him. I'm saying it to you. I just want you, Lord. I want you. I don't just want doctrine about you. I just don't want instruction about you. Amen. I want you. I got to have you. I, I, if, if, I don't, if I don't find you, if I don't find your heart, it's, it's not working, church. It's not working for any of us. If we don't really find Jesus in the pages of Scripture, we got to find Him. Right. Amen? Praise God. Thank you, Lord. All right, now in verses 21 through 26, now we're getting to the really good stuff. Amen? It says in verse 21, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested. This is, I'm back in the ESV, sorry. <laughs> now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. 
And this is one of my favorite scriptures, but I think it's because when the Lord revealed it to me, I was like, wow, all this time I've been reading it and I didn't even know what it meant. What he's saying is he's introducing us to God's righteousness. Then he's saying previously all we knew beforehand was that God's righteousness was revealed in the law. Right. But now the God's righteousness, the true righteousness of God has been manifested. The King James says revealed. And I need you to know that God's righteousness has a name. Amen. Amen. His name is Jesus. He's a person. Yes. He's the righteousness Amen. of God. Righteousness. Not your righteousness. Israel. Your righteousness. My righteousness. The Old Testament tells us our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. Right. But His righteousness. And listen, I can't explain to you how important the righteousness of God is in the kingdom of God. I cannot get across to you how serious to have a revelation of the righteousness of God, which is Jesus, and how this works. And so one, one thing I wanted to share with you is, is in Romans chapter 4, verses 3 and 5, the, the Apostle Paul talks about, he talks about Abraham. Can you just go ahead and put it up there? It says... For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. I meant to and so when it says that, that it says that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. One of the meanings of the word is that it was placed into his account. But one of the words that's also used is imputed. And the idea is that he, he, he put the righteousness of Jesus upon us. And, and so what you need to understand is, is that the righteousness of Jesus, there's, there's, there's also, there, and what righteousness does according to Romans 5 is that it gives us access to grace. Yes. Grace changes everything. Yeah. Grace not only forgives you, but grace, grace is a change agent. Yes. It's like a catalyst that changes everything. Yes. And, and, and because of now you're in righteous position with God, you can now have access to the grace of God. Amen. And, and it's given to us as a gift. You, you're good, Brooklyn. Thank you so much. You can carry that with you if you don't mind. It says it in verse 23. It says that the righteousness of God. I'm sorry, verse 22. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. See, God has a plan. And the way that you and I access the plan is through faith. When our faith meets God's plan, that's when the miracle happens. That's when the internal change happens to the inside of our heart. When we, when we realize that, that we are not righteous, when we realize we need help. You know, I was just thinking earlier today, I don't want to spend too much time on this because I want to respect your time. But look, back in my old life, I was thinking, I don't know, my mama, she got a pretty good memory for 90, I'll tell you that. I can remember one time I got it. I didn't even, I wasn't in healthcare. I was a Yahoo. I was a high school dropout at the time. But I remember one time I had drank too much and I fell down. I tried to catch myself. And I, I did what you call a subluxure to my thumb where I had a partial di dislocation. And then it was like a big old sore. And, you know, I mean, I'm a relatively tough guy. But, man, it hurt for like a week. And then I remember another time something happened. And, I, like, I couldn't. I was walking with a limp. And it was all from just my 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 behavior, my the, the crazy things that I was doing. And I can remember like after the second or third time that where it happened in about a couple of month period, I could just remember like, dude, this is miserable. Why? why, why? And I, I wasn't even yet thinking about calling on the Lord, even though I'd have been to church, but I'm just like, dude, this is this is miserable. Like, what am I doing? This is supposed to be fun. There's nothing. There's nothing fun about this, you know, and, and, and I just, I don't even know what my point was today, <laughs> other than thank you, Lord, for the gift of righteousness. Yes. Thank you for the gift of righteousness, and thank you now that I am righteous, you've washed all my sins away. Oh. I want you to know that that's, that's what you call justifying <clears throat> grace. Those that are justified. I wanted to spend a little bit of time here. I'm not going to keep you too much longer, but look. Those that are justified, justifying grace, that means you've been washed. Have you been washed? Has it? Please. Are you washed in the blood? 
in the soul cleansing blood of the land. Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the land? Hallelujah. Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Have you been washed in the blood of the Lamb? Justifying, this is justifying grace. This means you're righteous. The grace of God justifies you. It calls you innocent. Yes. Because you said yes to Jesus. And when you said yes to Jesus, your, your garments became spotless. They were made white as snow. Praise God. But now, they're sanctifying grace. See, the scripture says the Lord knows who belong to him and let everyone that belongs to the Lord depart from iniquity. Yes. And, and this is the good news. You can, we, you and I can depart from iniquity. We can walk a life where the Lord is empowering us by the grace of the Holy Spirit. And now he's giving us the strength. Listen, he's breaking the bondages in our life. He's, he's telling the devil, get off of them. Back off of them. This belongs to me. Can you, can, amen. Can you believe that tonight? He's worthy. And, and if we can believe that about the word of God, he'll start to give us freedom in our life. And then we won't walk around under condemnation and guilt. We won't walk around under condemnation. We can start believing him. We can start really believing him to do something, amen, to do something in us and to do something through us. Praise God. He's so good, amen. Praise God. You've been justified by his grace as a gift, that's verse 24, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Man, I'm telling you, every word is dripping with Jesus. Every word is dripping with his truth. Every word is dripping with his power, with his victory, with the gospel, man, you've been, it's, grace is a gift and through the redemption that is in Christ. You've been bought back. The word redemption means to be bought. You've been purchased with a price. You've been bought with, did you not know that you're not your own? You've been, per, you've been bought with a price. The precious blood of a lamb that was foreordained before the foundation of the earth. Amen? Amen. Probably quoting two different scriptures there, but it's so true. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Who God put forward as a propitiation by his blood. Now listen, that word there, that word propitiation, you see that word? That's a big old, that's a big old fancy word. And there's a lot of theology behind that. And, and to me, the first time I read it in a commentary, I like to come unglued out of my chair. I was like, how awesome is this? Okay, but I want you to understand that at its base meaning, propitiation is this, God's wrath was satisfied. God looked at his son, his only unique, only begotten son dying. And when he gave up his last breath, he looked at that and he said, finally, my wrath is satisfied. All those lambs, all the bleeding of sheep, all the shedding of blood through all of those years. Finally, my wrath is satisfied. Oh, my son. That's why it says it in Isaiah 53 that it pleased him to bruise him. But I want you to know this too, and this is deep, but we're just going to get just kind of just touch it. That word propitiation in the Greek language is the same word used in the Greek for the mercy seat. I don't know when the Day of Atonement is. When is the Day of Atonement? Uh, you bet Saturday or Sunday probably. Once a year, they would enter through the veil and they would apply blood to the, to the mercy seat because, see, the law was broken on the inside. And the angels, y'all remember that? I've taught on this so many times. I used to show pictures. The angels, the cherubim were on the mercy seat. They were looking towards each other, but they were actually looking down at the mercy seat. Once a year, see, the Lord said this. He said, Exodus 25, verse 8, build me a sanctuary that I might dwell with my people. Beyond the veil was a box. In the box was the law. The law was broken because Israel couldn't keep the law. The cherubim, which represent the presence. He said, between those cherubim, upon that mercy seat is where I'm going to meet with you. It represents the presence of God. The Ark of the Covenant represents the presence of God. That's why they walked around and within in front around Jericho seven times. That's why the walls had to come down. I'm here to tell you where the presence of the Lord is. There is freedom. Where the presence of the Lord is, there is liberty. Yes. But it was the blood that became a covering that now those cherubim are no longer peering through and seeing the broken law. Instead, they're seeing the blood of the innocent that goat that was offered up. And I'm here to tell you today that Jesus, Paul, you know what Paul's saying right here? Jesus is your propitiation. 
Jesus is your mercy seat. Listen, we've all broken the law. We've all been guilty. None of us are good. We get it. But thank God for the good one. Hallelujah. Thank God for Jesus. Thank God for his obedience even unto death and the shedding of his blood. I'm here to tell you tonight that you've been covered with the blood of the lamb. And that and now you are in right relationship with God. you got to believe that tonight. Listen, if you don't believe anything else that I say to you tonight, please walk out of this place knowing this. If you are saved tonight, you are right with God. Now, does that mean that we... We need to repent. You, you better believe whenever there's things in our life that aren't right, we need to repent. We need to get it right with the Lord. But quit walking around under a cloud of guilt. Quit walking around under a cloud of condemnation. You're no longer guilty if you're in Christ. Hallelujah. What a, what a, what a plan. What a beautiful plan and what a beautiful sacrifice. Amen. God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. You know, there, there were some other scriptures I was going to take you to. Uh, we don't really have time. Maybe the singers and musicians could come up. But in Acts 17, the Apostle Paul, you remember that story while they're coming up here and they're getting ready. The Apostle Paul goes to Athens and he's walking to this place called Mars Hill or the Areopagus. And, and according to what he says in the story, and according to archaeology, there was a pathway that led up there. And they, they had gods, statues of gods, lined up on both sides of the street. And the Apostle Paul, while he was walking, because, you know, preachers are always ready to, to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying. And he, they, he saw right there, and the Holy Spirit must have told him, right there, Paul. Right there, the unknown God. And he got up there and he said, I find that you people are very superstitious and religious. He said, you got a God to everybody. And he said, you got a God. And one of you think is the unknown God. He said, this is the one I want to talk to you about. The one that you don't know. And his name is Jesus. And he said, I need, to, I need you to understand why God had to send his son Jesus. Because in times past, the King James says this, God winked at sin. He's no longer winking at it. He's no longer forbearing it. He put his wrath on his son. And now he demands that men everywhere repent. It is so important that we repent and get our hearts right. Amen. It's so important that the world still hear this message, church. Amen. And when we repent, there's refreshing that comes with repentance. Let's worship the Lord tonight. Amen. As we close. Thank you, Lord.